Good morning. Welcome to the 2022 Home Visiting and Parenting Education Summit. I am pleased that you could join us today, and I am proud of the role of the North Carolina Partnership for Children in partnership with the North Carolina Home Visiting and Parenting Education System Collaborative in putting together this wonderful summit. My name is Amy Cubbage, and I am president of the North Carolina Partnership for Children. And I am also a mom of three kids. And it seems like just yesterday that I was a young mom, juggling the needs of my kids and feeling a little frazzled, even with background in early childhood. I may have called my pediatrician a few too many times for advice. And I'll never forget when she told me, Amy, I am not worried about the parents that call me, she said. I worry about those that I don't hear from or who can't reach me. Parenting is our most important job and we can all use support and advice. At NCPC and across the Smart Start Network, we believe in the power of home visiting and parenting education to strengthen families, to give kids the best start and to lay the foundation for long-term health. We believe in the power of home visiting and parenting education to support equity, remediating the effects of systemic racism and providing opportunities for all families. We know that our home visitors and parenting educators build and support the relationships that prevent adverse childhood experiences and develop protective factors and resiliency. In fact, the more we learn about brain development and the importance of strong relationships, the more we understand the lasting benefits of such programs like home visiting and parenting education. They are critical pieces of supporting the whole child and providing comprehensive early care and education as well. And that is why at the North Carolina Partnership for Children and across the Smart Start Network, we have been such advocates for home visiting and parenting education in communities across the state. It is why we partnered with the Family Connects program, Family Connects International, on pilots in rural communities with the support of preschool development grant funding. And it's why we have been such champions of the North Carolina Home Visiting and Parenting Education System Collaborative. Working together across models, across communities, we can increase access to these critical services across the state of North Carolina. So many more families and children could benefit from home visiting and parenting education services, and I know we will get there. So thank you to those of you who are instrumental in the planning and the research coordination that got us to this point. And thank you to those of you who have given your time, your talents, and your expertise to the development of the system. I will also make a specific shout out right here to folks on the communications and policy team at NCPC, as well as a wonderful consultant, Gina Capito, um, and others uh, across the home visiting uh, and parenting education system collaborative who worked tirelessly to put on this summit. And thank you to those who have supported the system financially and those who have made this summit available for all of us for free. The Division of Public Health, the Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina Foundation, the Duke Endowment, the Child Trust Foundation, the Weiner Family Foundation, and the John Rex Endowment. And a special thanks to our home visitors and parenting educators across the state. Each day, the connections, the support, the knowledge that you share with families are making a difference. Each day, even during a global pandemic, you are planting seeds that will grow and blossom. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Charlene Wong. Dr. Wong is a pediatrician, a researcher, policy expert, a leader in the state's response to COVID-19, and a mom. Dr. Wong will lead the new Division of Child and Family Wellbeing at the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. This division will work to ensure that North Carolina's children grow up safe, healthy, and thriving in nurturing and resilient families and communities. Welcome, Dr. Wong. Uh, 
All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much. Sorry, it took me a second to get the camera on and get off mute on this morning on this Monday morning. Um, Amy, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. I'm so pleased to be here with you all this morning. Um, I'm going to be just making some very brief remarks. Um, as Amy mentioned, I'm excited to be joining you today in a new role as Assistant Secretary for Children and Families. Um, as she mentioned, I'm also a practicing pediatrician, and like her, I am also a mom. And so uh, with all of these hats on, I'm, I'm very excited to be working alongside all of you all and a team at the Department of Health and Human Services to really support this concept of whole child and whole family health and well-being. As the Assistant Secretary for Children and Families, I'm overseeing both this new Division of Child and Family Wellbeing that I'll tell you a little bit more about briefly this morning, as well as the Division of Child Development and Early Education. And as Amy said, we're really at the department, across the department in both of these divisions, really continuing to work and focus on achieving our vision for children who are healthy and who thrive. And again, like she said, safe, stable, and nurturing families, schools, and communities. Again, you'll hear sort of these echoes of this concept of whole child, whole family health. So this new division of child and family well-being, which began launching this month, very exciting, will be weaving together programs that primarily serve children and youth to support whole child and whole family health and advance health equity. So these programs, importantly for the summit today, include many of our home visiting services alongside other health-related programs and services for kids, like school health promotion, programs for our children and youth with special health care needs. It also brings together many of the nutrition programs that support children and families, like our WIC program, our food and nutrition services, our SNAP program, and our child and adult care food program. We also recognize that physical and behavioral health are two sides of the same coin. So the new division will also include school and community mental health services for children and youth. So these include things like our programs that coordinate to support behavioral health for students in schools and services like system of care, which as you all know, coordinate resources for kids and families across multiple child serving agencies. And then also in the um, young child space, we have, will be bringing together the early intervention or infant toddler program, which provides supports and services to young children with developmental delays or established programs. So I wanted to zoom in on one of these programs that will be part of the new division, which are our home visiting programs or many of our home visiting programs. And this is really such a fantastic exemplar of the types of programs that we are excited to be promoting and expanding because we know that the benefits of home visiting programs truly support this concept of whole child and, fam and family health. Um, and it is not just whole child and family health outcomes, but really some of the outcomes that are really at the top of our priority list at the department. So first is we know that home visiting programs reduce incidences of child abuse and neglect because we want ch children to be safer and we certainly know that that's one of the outcomes of home visiting programs. And we want to safely lower the number of children who are entering our child welfare system. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we have really seen an unprecedented growth in children experiencing um, child abuse and neglect. Our child welfare system is in crisis as is the system across our country. And so we know that home visiting programs are such an important component of the solution set to prevent these traumatic experiences for children and for families. Related to that, another top priority is to get ahead of the child behavioral crisis writ large. Um, as a practicing primary care pediatrician, I've just seen so many young people during the pandemic who are for the first time having behavioral health challenges or young people who have had these behavioral health challenges really just escalate so much during the pandemic. And we know that home visiting programs and getting super far upstream is really what we wanna to do to get um, ahead of this crisis. We also know that home visiting programs improve school readiness. You know, as a, again, as a pediatrician, I really look to performance in school and being ready for school as one of those key metrics when we think about how do we measure child well-being. And again, we're very excited that between the new Division of Child and Family Wellbeing and the Division of um, Child Development and Early Education, together those divisions now house many of the programs that work 
most closely with schools so that we can coordinate even more effectively with schools to support school readiness as well as student well-being in schools and certainly looking to build upon the much deeper connections in many ways that we formed with schools during the COVID-19 pandemic. And then finally, we always are thinking about multi, multiple generations together when we think about whole child and whole family well-being. And we know, again, one of those outcomes that we're excited about, continue to be very excited about with home visiting programs is that they make moms and babies healthier together. And again, taking that sort of approach is a really top priority for the department. So I'm very excited for this important and timely summit today, particularly as we are launching this new division of child and family well-being. And I'm really looking forward to how together all of us can continue to build upon the decades of really excellent and innovative work in North Carolina to best support whole child and family health and well-being in our state. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Wong. It's wonderful to have you here. And now I'm pleased to introduce a friend who has made improving opportunities for children her life's work. Libby Doggett has worked for more than 40 years to build public will and strong, diverse local coalitions to improve family support and early learning systems for our youngest children and their families. She holds a PhD from the University of Texas in Austin. And during the Obama administration, Libby oversaw the Race to the Top Early Learning Challenge and Preschool Development Grants and served as the Department of Education's liaison on early learning issues with the White House and other federal agencies. She also led two national campaigns for the Pew Charitable Trust. One was a home visiting campaign that advanced a robust research agenda and provided support to advocates in targeted states. Pre-K Now was a 10 year campaign to advance high quality universal pre-kindergarten for all three and four year olds in states across the country. Today, Libby serves on numerous national and state boards, including Parents as Teachers and Family Connects, and volunteers on projects focusing on scaling and strengthening evidence-based home visiting and early learning programs in Austin, Texas, and across the nation. I am excited to hear the wisdom and perspective that Libby will share with us today as North Carolina continues to build its system of home visiting and parenting education. Libby, welcome. Thank you, Amy. Good morning. You are all heroes and I'm delighted to be here with you, each and every one of you. The work you do every day makes our communities and our country stronger. You are essential workers during, do, doing the critical work of supporting families. Families are the best service delivery system we have, and we need to do everything we can to support them in the important work of raising our future leaders. Think of all you do in your personal life for your kids or your grandkids like me, and all your parents did to help you succeed. This work of love and obligation is enormous. Government can never replace the impact of families on, on children. So the more we do to educate and support families, the better we are as a society. Our work today of discussing how to create a comprehensive home visiting and parenting education program will have lasting impacts on the families and children and the future of your state and actually what happens in other states. You know, for me and leaders in early childhood from across the country, North Carolina has led the way. The country looks to North Carolina for guidance in all things having to do with young children, ages birth to age eight. Many years ago, when I was appointed by then Governor Ann Richards to sit on our Texas State Early Childhood Council, we immediately advised the experts staffing the council to help us replicate Smart Start from North Carolina. Sadly, this never happened, but many other states now have their own version of Smart Start. You know, your leadership in early learning, 
workforce development, systems building, research and advocacy, and now home visiting and parenting education are extraordinary. I predict many states are going to look at your home visiting and parenting education system and your implementation of that system for guidance in their states. By pulling together home visiting and parenting education, you are creating a continuum of support that can help meet parents' needs as children age and family situations change. By offering multiple home visiting models, I think you have 12 across the state, you've been reflective and responsive to community needs. While Durham Connects, which is now Family Connects, is not statewide yet, it is serving as an entry point into the early childhood education system across the country, including in my home state of Texas. Before we explore the challenges and solutions to your work of creating a system that works for families, I want to thank you for the unique burden and role that home visiting and parenting education staff have carried during the pandemic. From my perch as a board member of the National Parents as Teachers Program, I saw how quickly you made the switch to virtual. While restaurants and offices shut down, you got busy delivering packets to families front porches, providing hotspots from your cars, finding food, internet services, rent subsidies, and other things that most that those most in need needed. The amount of trauma you must have carried and is and often being the only point of contact for many families of young children is bound to be tremendous. All the while you had to juggle your own family's needs, deal with the virtual learning and cleaning supply shortages, and so much more. You turned on a dime to deliver services virtually and kept many families from falling apart. You're making it through an unprecedented global pandemic that has changed us all and the world. I thank you for that. What you have done is truly heroic. But let's get back to the work at hand. The challenges that North Carolina faces in delivering home visiting and family support services are mirrored across the country, creating an opportunity for North Carolina to be a model system to model system transformation. Home visiting and parenting education are becoming one and jointly will be one of the first steps in the early childhood education health continuum. You are building a system. But let's talk a minute about what a system is. What are they? How do they help us? Why are they needed? Wikipedia defines a system as a group of interacting or interrelated elements that act according to a set of rules to form a unified whole. In life, we're surrounded by systems. In fact, we use them all the time to stay organized and to get things done. It can be as simple as a system for paying your bills or planning your family meals for the week, or more complex like carpools or keeping a Sunday school class going. Now I want you to take 30 seconds to list on a sheet of paper three systems you use in your personal or professional life and think about how these systems help you. We have a stopwatch to mind the time. I'm sure you came up with some good ideas. Now I want to look at systems that we as a community have put in place to help achieve certain goals. What systems come to mind? Most importantly, I want you to think about what are the characteristics of those systems that are working well? 
This time, I want you to share your input on the Mentimeter. And I have the amazing Gina Capito to help me with this. So Gina, I'm going to turn it over to you for a minute. Good morning, everyone. Great to be here. Thanks, Libby. So we are going to, you're going to see a link in the chat to the Mentimeter. There'll also be a code in case you need it when you follow the link. And what we're looking for here is just to answer this question around the idea of how would you describe a strong or functioning system? What word would you use to describe it? We want to see that concept come to life for all of us together. So take a minute. You should see in the chat the link to the Mentimeter. There it is. And just a reminder, here's the question that you're answering. What are the characteristics of a well-functioning community system? I'm going to give you all a minute to get over to the Mentimeter, make sure it's working, and then we'll take a look at what's happening. Probably you've all had a chance to do a Mentimeter in the last two years of virtual meetings. It basically makes, in this instance, we are making a word cloud. And if you have any trouble with the actual link, don't hesitate to put your word in the chat. We'll capture those as well. I see it moving and getting bigger and that equitable is definitely one that's come up. So thanks for that in the chat as well. Early access, I love it, Mary. Prevention, let's get upstream. All right, I'm gonna take us over to the Mentimeter here in the screen so that in case you're not viewing it, everybody gets to see all your great thoughts coming together. So just bear with me while I move screens. There we go. If there was a little bit of a delay there, Sharissa, with the screen sharing, you should see words moving around and you can see the concepts that are shared or most in common become the biggest words in the word cloud. And what's great about a Mentimeter is you can save the graphic afterwards. So saving this concept of on January 31st and early 22, what did everybody think about what was the most important words to describe a well-functioning system? We can check in in a year, two years, three years, see what you think. I love that. That's really, really captured exactly what we really want systems to do. We want them to make things more equitable. We want them to collaborate. We want them to work together. We want them to communicate. Uh, so thank you for that. Thank you, Gina. Sure. The Mentimeter will stay live even as we move on. So if you're just getting the tech working and just figuring out how to add your word, don't hesitate to keep doing it. We'll keep it live for a little while longer. And you can see we plan to involve you in this uh, keynote. You can't just sit back and sip your coffee. So <laughs> North Carolina has been a leader in so many ways. But I recently discovered some very real challenges you may encounter in your work. You probably already know about these. The prenatal to age three policy impact center, which just moved sadly from the University of Texas to Vanderbilt, looked at the level of resources a single mom, we'll call her Lena, has to provide for her children, an infant and a toddler in each state across the country. Based on the actual data regarding state policy choices and dollar amounts of minimum wage, childcare out of pocket costs, WIC, SNAP, federal state earned income tax credits, Medicaid, and policies around paid family leave, the Impact Center was able to compare the level of resources Lena and her children would have in each state. By analyzing state policies, the Impact Center was able to calculate how much Lena has left of her earnings from her minimum wage job after paying for childcare, collecting all the benefits for which she's eligible in North Carolina and other states. This unique analysis clearly illustrates that there's substantial variation in available resources during the critical periods, period, but prenatal to age three based on state policy choices. 
Sadly and surprisingly for me, Lena fares worse in North Carolina than in any other state, including my state of Texas, including Mississippi. That makes your work doubly hard. It means that you, as professionals in home visiting and parenting education, have fewer resources for your families. You have fewer places to turn to for help, and you have families, despite everything, who can't earn their way out of poverty. That means you have a lot of work ahead. I'm glad Dr. Wong is engaged because you're going to need her help. So you're embarking on an exciting new path. A coordinated system of parenting education and home visiting that will meet Lena's needs and those of countless other families. I want to discuss what a successful system of parenting edu education and home visiting looks like. And I have eight specific challenges to cre creating that system and some solutions that I've seen from across the country in home visiting and in other areas. Then we want to hear from you. Some of you have been doing this work for decades. You have things that you're doing in your region that are really working to address these challenges. You have solutions that need to be replicated and scaled. So the first four challenges I have are here. And the first one is equity, which of course fits with our Mentimeter. First, how do we create an equitable system? You know, the historic, systemic, and structural racism that plagues the United States has done tremendous damage to systems. Home visiting and parenting education have not been exempted. Decades of exclusionary and harmful policies have exacerbated existing needs and often result in inequitable access to programs. Long-standing, significant underfunding has caused a scarcity mindset which has driven state policymakers to make difficult decisions about how to allocate limited resources, despite consistently increasing needs throughout the system. And in doing so, policymakers have too often overlooked the children, families, and providers who've been deeply harmed by these trade-offs. This combined with the histor history of race-based exclusionary policies has disproportionately impacted black and other communities of color, particularly those with the lowest incomes. So the question is, how do you target the families most in need? Families like mine will jump in for everything they're eligible for because we know we need help. How do you get help to the people who don't call, the people that Amy was talking about earlier? Inequities and limited state budgets have forced programs to compete for funding and sometimes even to compete for families. When I ran an early childhood intervention program years ago, we had to sit down as directors in Central Texas to figure out uh, who would take certain families because we found that we were competing for families. We had to have a long memo of understanding and it really did help. More recently, when we've implemented a Family Connects program in Bastrop, a small community outside of Austin, the Parents as Teachers program staff were sure this would diminish their enrollment. They were very worried about Family Connects coming in. Just the opposite happened. Family Connects was able to become the main referral source for parents as teachers. Enrollment grew and referrals were more appropriate. The fourth challenge I often see is that families can't find the services they need. Or families who need the services don't get don't sign up. So we're not reaching the family families that need our services the most. How can we build single points of entry or no wrong door systems? We know more money will help, but we can't let funding prevent us from building a system that serves families better. Now once again, it's your turn. And I'm going to turn it over to Gina once again to get input from you. Gina? Thanks. All right, so I know that in North Carolina communities across the state, you were doing a lot of things to work on 
these challenges, parts of these challenges, or things that you've been doing for years and maybe you don't even realize they are part of the systemic solution. So what we wanna do next is make sure that we are hearing those things from you as well. So moving on to our next bit of input, we're gonna use something called an idea board. So you're gonna see a link again in the chat here in a second, thinking about those four challenges that Libby just walked us through, this idea of the system being inequitable, programs are competing for funding as well as families or have a perception that they are competing for families and that families themselves can't find those needed services, bearing those four ideas in mind. Now let's move to that idea board and think about what you and your community are already doing to approach solutions to these system level problems. The idea board is like a post-it. It's as if we were all in a room and there was big sheets of white paper and we had markers. You just go and write what you're thinking. What's great about the idea board is that you can also upvote once you see a colleague or a peer put something out there that you like the idea, you don't have to retype the whole thing. You can just do the plus in the corner of their post-it note to upvote the concept to kind of add that, that you too see that going on in your community or it's something that you're working on. And so with this, we really want to have this opportunity to hear more from you around the things that you're already doing as part of this home visiting and parenting education system. So you should see the link there for the idea board from Sarah in the chat. Go ahead and give it a click. Right. We're going to give you a few minutes to do this activity because the great thing about an idea board is that once the uh, concepts start populating on the board, one, it will may trigger things that, that you weren't even thinking about that, that you're doing in your community, and it gives you the opportunity to upvote those things that you see that you know you're also engaged in. So we've got to get a little momentum with the idea board. So we're going to be quiet here for a sec, and then I'm going to take a look and see how it's going on your end and see those ideas flowing in. All right, I'm already seeing lots of post-its, lots of upvotes. All right, keep them coming. I'm going to pause sharing for one sec. Nothing happened. If you're seeing the screen with the welcome to the summit, because I want to get us over to the men to the idea board so that for folks that maybe are don't have the access to the technology, you can see how the ideas are coming in as well. So on the screen that I'm sharing, I'm going to pull up the idea board because there's lots of great things coming in on the screen. Just saw one get added, a roll and read event with a partnership across three different entities, including home visiting. I love it. And I'm not familiar with the roll and read. All right, so I'm gonna bring this up sharing again so that you all can see the ideas that are coming in. There are a number of good ones about having families be a part of the system as either staff or listening to them. I like those. Serving on each other's boards. Communication, right? That one came up and that's one of those other key words that you mentioned as a description of a strong functioning system. And collaboration, you know how hard it is to, to do those things. 
I do like the idea that we're using social media and uh, you're in North Carolina 360 to help connect clients to services. There's lots going on as I expected and we just need to scale what's really working. That's right. And think about ways that you all as active participants in these local system ideas can help scale it at the state level and help roll these things out on a broader level. It's slowing down a little bit as far as entries, Libby, but this too will continue to be open. So if you're having ideas or having any trouble with the post-its, don't hesitate to keep working on it or put the things in the chat as well. You can always use the chat. Gina, thank you. You're an excellent tech partner. Let's get my <laughs> back on. There we go. So I wish we only had four challenges, but I have four more for you. So administrative procedures make it difficult for programs and families to enroll sometimes. We know for a fact that many systems that we set up just don't work. We ask for documents that aren't really needed. We don't share information across systems so, so that families have to repeatedly provide documentation and information. And sometimes we even degrade families by the complexities of what they have to provide for us or what they're even eligible for. Fortunately, many groups are working on solutions. One such group is the Child Poverty Action Lab in Dallas. This organization did a thorough redesign of WIC and significantly increased WIC uptake in that city. I tell this story because I think it's really relevant to home visiting. They started by just talking to families and then to grocery stores. They looked at every part of the system and then they worked with families to identify solutions that worked and they tested whether or not they were working. They ended up labeling WIC products in the stores much more vividly so that they were families could find them. They also printed uh, flyers that were very clearly labeled of what pregnant women could were, were eligible for, and then the products that were there for children up to the age of two. And families could get these flyers before they even entered the store so they didn't end up at the counter with something that they couldn't purchase through WIC. They found that this significantly increased WIC uptake, and we know how important that is for infants and toddlers and for pregnant moms. I already discussed a major challenge you have in North Carolina that other parts of the larger system for families don't work well. You heard Lena's story. So I hope you'll use that report card that the Impact Center did and use it to share with policymakers because Medicaid, the minimum wage, and other policies make your work supporting families all that more challenging. And finally, we don't have enough data. Dr. Wong and Amy talked a little bit about some of the great outcomes. We need to have more and better data. We need to, data to show that families are less likely to become a part of foster care system, more likely to select quality childcare, more likely to get a GED and a job, and that kids themselves are entering pre-K prepared to succeed. And we also need your stories. Most importantly, we need to get the data and the stories into the hands of family-friendly policy leaders, and we all have them in our states, so that they can act on them. Now it's your turn again to tell me what's working in North Carolina in these areas. I want to hear how you're, you're connecting with some of your policy leaders, how you're putting families' voices out there, how you're telling your story, because we've got to make sure we're not insular, that we are sharing what we are learning and what we're doing with the community. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Gina, again, to go to an idea board. Let's take a look at these. These may feel a little bit harder, particularly when you think about administrative gaps or the idea that the system has gaps, that the state itself isn't necessarily always, doesn't always feel like it's prioritizing families, but we know that there are things that you're doing in the local communities that are driving at these challenges. They probably feel a little bit uh, 
got to dig deeper and think about what am I really doing that is helping address an administrative barrier that maybe I don't feel like I have control over. I'm not the one that sets the contracts. I just work in and administer the programs to families. But think a little bit about how you go about it because those are all strategies that can be taken as part of the whole home visiting and parenting ed system and make a real impact on the work together as a state. So it's not just you and a local community working on a strategy, but taking that strategy larger. So again, we're going to do the, the same idea board approach different one because you did such a great job populating the last one so we need a new board new post-it notes you're starting fresh thinking about these four challenges but similar it's the exact same approach in that when you think about these four challenges and you dig a little deep and think about how your community is approaching solutions to these challenges and we use the concept of approaching solutions because we know that sometimes we are working on the beginning step of a solution it isn't the whole solution but it's a piece of it and so that's very intentional that term you don't have to have the whole thing solved to share your solution and to share the ways that you're working on an issue and we want you to bring those ideas so dig a little deep and think about these four priorities Again, you're going to see the link in the chat for this particular idea board. Same instructions, post-it notes, upvotes, and I saw lots of great upvoting, 12, 8 more people upvoting concepts on the last idea board. So I see you got that one down. And just take a minute and think a little bit. We're going to give you a little bit of silence on this one since these are some even more intractable systemic issues to deal with. Right, see a couple folks out there already. So if you're not at the board yet, go ahead and um, hop on over and you'll see some of the ideas of things that your colleagues are doing. I love it that people are applying for grants to help fill the gaps. But I particularly love it that you're meeting with your local elective offic officials because you've got to do that as hard as it is. Are you going to see the welcome screen again while you're working on the idea board? No technological difficulties, I promise. It's just me moving screens. So keep I'm working so, on those ideas. I'm so glad that people are getting families involved in the decision making because it really does change the outcome. Coordinating with Think Babies. I love that one, Libby. It's another example of North Carolina as a leader integrating national zero to three advocacy campaign into a prenatal to three plan for the state funded by Pritzker and then doing the, the hard work as the first Pritzker state now um, almost four years in doing this work focused on prenatal to three, but pulling it all together, not having it be islands or isolated. So great to I hear love locally the doing that. I love the eggs and issues. Actually, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, parents as teachers in a minute when we did a forum and eggs and issues was uh, featured. All right, so again, for anyone that's not having as much luck with the tech, I don't want you to feel like you're alone out there if you're having a bad, bad Monday tech morning. So I'm going to share the idea board on the screen too. See, I told you, Gina, there, the solutions are there in North Carolina. All we need to do is we need to shine a light on what's working well and scale it up. That's right. We need to mine them. You got to get those county commissioners. You know, county commissioners often become state legislators and then they become members of Congress and we, we need to be educating everybody at all levels. We're even inviting our sheriff over to look at a program. Mm -hmm. Yep. We have to be thinking about partners outside of typical early care and education or typical family service because it does impact and sometimes those can be your strongest champions, your sheriff's departments and your emergency response folks. Absolutely. We're all in this together. 
and we need to make sure we do that in our community because you can't do that from a state level and you certainly can't do that from a national level. I love the idea of Go ahead, sir. I just said I love the idea of collecting clean data. Yep. That's where I was going to because we've got uh, the, the system has a assessment and planning committee and the one of the things that the goal of that committee is and folks will hear about it throughout the summit is to really support the access to the data, how to building your capacity locally on using the data, transferring it into planning and then responding to it. So we really love to hear that that knowledge of how important the data is, your local use of it and access to it. Yeah. Refresh again. Is it a little harder to come up with some of these, this set of challenges? Feel may a little bit maybe like your locus of control is a tad further away on this one, but there's great things coming up. So it's clear that you have the motivation for it. I hope you all will keep these and use them because I, I know that uh, what you, there's nothing from the outside, from Texas, from me, even from Gina, that you, you don't already know, that somebody in your state doesn't already know this. We have the expertise there in North Carolina to do what needs to happen, make the changes. Are we ready to move on, Gina? Yeah, I'll give it one more refresh here. See another row pops up. I think that's a great last one on reminding organizations leadership of the day in and day out successes. Systems change is incremental, very small, and you have to take those wins and really acknowledge them. You're talking about changing generational systemic change here. So it's not going to happen next month. It's not going to necessarily even happen in 2023. And so that's why it's so important that the system stays around, right? I'm going to move us back to the slide deck, Libby. That's actually a perfect segue, uh, Gina, because really what I want to conclude with, how do we ensure that the system that you're building today, which I'm so excited about, is around in 20 years to serve families? Because we can't build a system and then have it disappear. So I love this quote from Lily Tomlin. I always wondered why somebody doesn't do something about that. Then I realized I was somebody. My personal realization that I was somebody didn't come until I had my own children. I'm a big believer in the public school system, not only for the education it provides, but for how much we learn from each other. So my kids went, I have two daughters, and my grandkids, all four of them, now go to public schools. When busing came to Austin, though, many years ago, when my kids were little, I said, my kids are going to be the first ones on the bus. But I didn't want them to be the only ones on the bus. So I stood up and made my opinions known and found so many other parents who felt the same way I did. I learned that I could be somebody and make a difference. While we lost some of my friends to private schools, we kept many more in the system and public schools in Austin are better for it. Being an advocate starts with you. Sticking up for yourself and your family. It can be as simple as just saying no or maybe even yes to something a friend begs you to do or as complicated as advocating for a pay raise. But we know because we choose, chose a helping field that life is not all about us and that to give is to receive. So the heart of advocacy means sticking up for others. It means putting families and their needs at the center of your work. This can involve something as simple as suggesting a small change to your program so that will make families feel more comfortable or as complicated as helping a family fight for benefits they were unjustly denied. You as advocates will move to a whole other level when you help families speak up for themselves. We need to really hear and listen to what families are telling us they need and want and then we need to act on it. 
I recently had the opportunity to see the power of parent voice at the National Parents as Teachers Conference in Baltimore this fall. I had the pleasure of facilitating a roundtable about family voice. It was rated by attendees as one of the best sessions. That's where they fe featured the eggs and issues. And they really, people really loved hearing the stories of families and hearing how families talked about their experiences with home visiting and parenting education. So I recommend that you, we all do that a lot more. Part of being an advocate is also telling others about your work. We will never make families a priority in this country until many more people hear about the struggles families face and the supports that you provide them. You need to make sure that all your friends and acquaintances at church and in your neighborhood and in your family know about your work and the challenges families face. And we need your help in implementing this system. I think you've seen from your leaders today, this is the point for more engagement. This is not a closed or a finished system. Your leaders want to hear your input and how to prioritize what's most important and determine how the work gets done. And finally, take care of yourselves. The work you do is challenging and it can be exhausting. We need each of you. So please give yourselves a break. Do something to treat yourself now and then. Now I want you to take just 30 seconds and write down two things in the chat that you're going to do immediately to help implement this awesome system. So Gina, feel free to jump in and help me comment on some of the things we're seeing. Sure thing. So we're just using the chat for this one. No link, no idea board or post-it notes, just old school in the chat. So we can all see each other's thoughts on what you would like to do next? What are you thinking that strikes you the most to get engaged in the system? Helping families' voices to be heard. Let's see what else. Help families' voices be heard. Yes, we want to do that. Put families at the center. Help families know what their rights are. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I hope you'll look at the uh, Child Poverty Lab and see what they did around with. It's pretty amazing and it could be done in every community. I hope you will reach out to your elected officials. These are just people and they are elected to serve us. We need to make sure we know them. Making sure leadership is hearing the need. That's true. Sometimes we have leaders who don't hear that need. I do I love this. It's so much more than a job. It really is. When you're doing what you love and your passion, it is so much more than a job. It's a life. I love the idea of cleaning up your data and then linking it with personal stories. Sharing the success. We need to do that so much more. That idea of it being so much more than a job is one of the reasons why a system that is bigger than your organization, your program model that you deliver is so important because we know that that is the case, that so many staff in home visiting and parenting education programs carry it as more than a job. And you shouldn't be alone as an island trying to do that. You need the support of training and quality supports. You need a system that's working on those administrative barriers so you're not alone with it. You need a system that's thinking about funding. And those are all the pieces of of the North Carolina Home Visiting and Parenting Ed system. So you all being part of it and really seeing this as your moment to dig in deep on the systemic change is such critical for the success of the system and the future of it, the long term of it. So thank you for raising up that idea of that it is more than a job. And we all have to remember that as we support each other. And when we have a system, we know we have shared values, we have certain rules we all abide by, and we have the support uh, from people across the state and from people uh, who are running the system. So I, I think what you're doing is pretty incredible. So state early childhood policy progress is dependent 
both on the state policy environment, but mostly on the people running the program, and that's you. Everyone in the system is important. Working both independently and collaboratively, you will achieve wins for young children. I'm sure of it. Your work in implementing and improving the system will never be done, though. But today, we're on our way to a new level of success. And I want to close with this very, very powerful quote from one of my favorite leaders. It was a long time ago, but it was during a period of war. And in some ways, you know, with all that's going on with with systemic racism and with COVID, we are almost in a warlike situation. So I chose this one from Churchill. Success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. So I wish you courage and I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful summit. Thank you for including me. Thank you so much, Libby. We so appreciate your time and your integration of thoughts from across the country as a national leader in all things early education and family support. So with that, we are now actually at a summit break. You have a bit of a pause before the next sessions. I'm just gonna check and see if there's any staff from the system or NCPC that have any other housekeeping items. We have a survey that we wanna share out regarding the session. So if you, since you have a couple minutes here before you have to go on to the next item, and the next session actually begins at 10.15, so you have a nice break. Hopefully get another cup of coffee or grab yourself some breakfast to and join the next session, which you're going to hear a lot more about the Home Visiting and Parenting Education Collaborative Board and the shared leadership approach that the group uses. But do take a minute to also fill in the survey. I'm not seeing the, okay, there it is. There's the link for the survey. Sorry, I wasn't seeing it in the chat quite yet, Sarah. So yes, please complete the survey. We'll have a brief break and then you'll go back to your agenda page and click on the next session to join. And that is the introduction to the collaborative board. So we look forward to seeing you all there. Um, if you have any questions, please reach out to special events at smartstart.org or we can meet you here in the chat as sessions uh, continue. But thank you so much for joining us and for a great kickoff to this summit.